Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys uh, this morning. If you would grab your Bibles and please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, we are dealing with a passage this morning that directly deals with God's rejection of an anointed king over Israel. And I think we would all acknowledge that this is a heavy topic to teach about and to discuss. So before we start, I want you to tune in very carefully and, and hear something from, I pray, the heart of God for you this morning. God is for you. He is with you wherever you go. He desires nothing more than that your life would bear fruit that remains that you would be a vessel of honor prepared for the master's good use. He will never leave you nor forsake you and loves you more than you could imagine and is committed to you more than you could ever know. Are you now ready to be rebuked? <laughs> Just kidding. Before I move to the beautiful state of Missouri, you haven't been to Missouri if you don't understand that joke. I grew up in California, and for a number of years when I was a child, probably between second and fourth grade, my dad pastored a small church in Joshua Tree. It was actually really neat to go back to Joshua Springs CBI to teach some courses there and to drive by that church where I have a picture of myself and my family right in front of that little building out there in Joshua Tree. Pretty special thing. And... I have this memory of Joshua Tree that just popped in my mind the other day of my dad letting me sit on his lap in our 1970s Suburban and drive the car down a street. Now my dad's here, I think the statute of limitations has passed, don't tell on him. But uh, I remember I was probably eight or nine years old and I have this memory of sitting on his lap with the steering wheel in my hands eyes wide open, you know, just thinking, what an amazing thing I'm driving. Probably at the risk of some mailboxes and some people's front yards and maybe an animal or two along the way. Thankfully, there was a father there with his hands on the wheel and his feet on the pedals, guiding the direction of where things were headed. Fast forward seven years, and there was that kid with his permit, learning how to drive. And I remember specifically, we were on Highway 71, we were there in Corona. I was driving with my dad. He was teaching me the ropes. And at the time, the highway, you know, it's a two-lane highway, it swerves through the hills. And I remember saying something to the effect of, I'm kind of nervous right now. And I'll never forget the words my dad told me. He said, that's good as long as you remain that way every time you drive this road, you won't get into an accident. Now, regarding that car, I wasn't responsible for the power or the mechanics that enabled the car to go or the fuel that was causing the combustion, but I did have a greater responsibility at that point to manage the gas and the brake and the steering and the awareness required to not blow through stop signs and look around me it was a different weight of responsibility. I still had the joy of driving. But it wasn't that kid who cared nothing about the mechanics of driving, just the thrill of it. And, you know, when I consider the church of Jesus Christ, the ministry that God has entrusted to us, we recognize something very important. The church is, is God's vehicle. <laughs> Amen? Like, he supplies the power that makes it go. He enables the mechanics to make it move. Ultimately, he's our GPS guiding our course, telling us where to go and how to get there. Without him, all you're doing is sitting in a car that isn't going anywhere. But he has chosen to navigate this vehicle through human leaders, under shepherds. For some reason, according to his grace, he has given us hands on the wheel and feet on the pedals, as it were, 
And I don't want to make it sound like the sole responsibility for the ministry's success is somehow on your shoulders or mine. We know better than that. But Paul did seem to indicate that it matters how we drive the car. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12, Paul said, I thank Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. There he says, it's clear that God enables everything to happen. By his grace, I am what I am. It's not like I found myself into this position, making the church grow and operate based on my own strength or wisdom or effort or gifts. But he also says, just as Jesus enabled me, he also counted me faithful. He counted me faithful to not blow through his divine stop signs. He counted me faithful to listen and yield to his leading. He counted me faithful to be who I am behind the scenes as I am in front of the pulpit or in front of the people. And herein lies a very important truth that the maturing minister recognizes that the thrill of the ministry is not the same as the responsibility of the ministry. Ministry always has its thrills and its joys, but as you grow in the Lord, you recognize that you cannot be sustained in the ministry by all the high moments and all the thrills and all the frills, that there are anchors, foundational roots that have to be established in regards to the responsibility of the ministry. All ministry is filled with thrills, salvations, baptisms, elations, and moments of praise, moving into larger facilities that can handle the larger growth. People compliment your sermon once, and all of a sudden you think you're the next Chuck Smith or something, and you're just walking on cloud nine, moving from that next high, next ministry high to that next ministry high. But behind the thrills is a list of responsibilities where God allows our feet to hit the gas and our hands to steer the will. How I love my wife like Christ, how I lead and discipline and disciple my children, how I'm engaged in the discipline of prayer and study to show myself approved and maintain integrity behind the scenes and deal with my emotions and my failures and my frailties in honesty and humility and repentance. All of those things are the building blocks of what allows a minister to drive, as it were, the ministry long-term in a way that finishes well. Many sermons have been taught on the contrast between Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. The first king was a bit of a train wreck birthed out of the people's carnal desires, and the other was a prophetic masterpiece enabled and designed by God to bring his sovereign and eternal plan to pass through the line and seat of David, which would ultimately culminate in the Savior Jesus Christ coming to save all of mankind. And while both kings were clearly ordained and anointed by God, Saul was a bit of a divine concession to the cries of the people for a king just like the other nations. For them, God's deliverance, God's guidance, God's protection and provision weren't sufficient. The word of God coming through Samuel the prophet wasn't enough for them. They wanted more like their forefathers in the wilderness who filled their carnal bellies with the meat They wanted the flesh and blood meat of a king that would cause them to look like the other nations. They had it pretty good under God's gracious hand, but Samuel warned them, you want a king, that's fine, but he will take your tithes and he will take taxes and he will take your grain and your grapes and your olives and wheat to supply his own household. That's where the joys of government just started really settling in, people. And so God gave them a king they deserved because they demanded it, the king that matched their carnal thinking and their foolish desires, a king whose heart was after his, himself rather than God, King Saul. And from looking on the outside in, Saul seemed to have all the qualifications, the characteristics one would expect in a victorious and powerful king, a head taller than all the rest, handsome, winsome, bold, and strong. Yet ultimately, Saul would prove to be an example for all of us for the rest of time of a timeless image of the nature and the work of the flesh and the inevitable reaping that occurs when one sows to the flesh. 
King David, on the other hand, was far from being the People's Choice Award winner. Even the spiritually minded Samuel almost missed God's election of this young man, assuming that certainly God was looking for another Saul, the tall, the strong, the charismatic, not the young, ruddy shepherd who everyone assumed was playing childish games in the field with his father's sheep. And while far, uh, being far from perfect, David ended up being a picture of a king whose loyalty was fiercely committed to God, a king who understood dependency and faith and worship and humility and repentance. And ultimately, David would serve as an illustration of the spiritually minded man, ultimately even a picture of Jesus himself, obviously without the sin, and the incredible plan of God that can be accomplished through a life that is wholeheartedly submitted to God and his reign and his rule over their hearts. The selection of David and Saul as kings have their own unique and different stories, but they also had one thing in common. When Samuel came to find them, both Saul and David were both involved in work with their father's animals. 1 Samuel chapter 9 records what Saul was doing when Samuel sought him out to anoint him as king. We read in chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalishiah, but they did not find them. And he passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not there. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. So Saul was chasing after his father's donkeys. In a different way, David, when Samuel came to anoint David, was looking after his father's sheep. For Samuel 16, 11 records this. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for I will not sit down until he comes here. You could rightly say that in a tale of two kings, there was one who was chasing donkeys and another who was tending sheep. And I sometimes wonder and have to think about my own life and ministry. Which one am I doing? It seems to me that Saul's pursuit of a donkey was appropriate. It wouldn't be the first time God used a donkey to get a carnally minded man where he needed to be. But the donkeys are resistant animals. They tend to have their own mind. Unlike sheep, who can also be fairly stupid and led by the wrong, in the wrong direction, donkeys just resist being led at all. Donkeys don't want a shepherd. They want to call the shots. Scientists indicate that donkeys are resistant, not because they're so much stubborn, but to quote one, Donkeys are self-protective and self-preserving. That is why they don't follow. Donkeys are only looking out for donkeys. They're not looking to be led. The donkey has a donkey-first mentality. Again, the danger of being a sheep is that sheep are followers and can be led in the wrong direction by wrong leaders. But the danger of being a donkey is the unwillingness to be led by anyone other than yourself. And this would prove to be the tenor of Saul's entire life and his rule. He was willing to let God enforce a few external guidelines as long as he was the one who had the final word. As long as it was Saul's kingdom and Saul's agenda and Saul's desires and Saul's image and Saul's appearance. Saul was okay with letting God be part of that as long as he was the one who could make the decisions about where to go and what to do. In Saul's life, he was the one who had the final word. Saul, like the people, was willing to acknowledge the reality of God, but he was not willing to submit to him or to trust him or to fear him. You might even say of the people of Israel of that time that they might have called themselves one nation under God. They might have had their motto, in God we trust. But in reality, they were fiercely, independently minded, and Saul was no different. Saul was only okay with God as much as God served Saul. David, on the other hand, we know that he was not satisfied 
with a God who would merely serve himself. David recognized the need to be led. The Lord is my shepherd. I might be a king, but I'm, only, I'm also just a sheep. I need to be led by still waters and into green pastures. I need him to set the table before me in the presence of my enemies, and I need him to lead me all through life and through the shadow of death until that day where I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In praying and preparing for this conference, I realize that many pastors and churches today still operate between two places. Some pastors and churches and leadership teams are chasing donkeys, and some are tending sheep. Some are calling the shots and others are being led. Some are depending upon the arm of flesh and the strength of man and others are being led by the spirit and depending upon the word of God. If I may speak plainly, pulpits that are filled by men who acknowledge Christ but refuse to submit to Christ will end in disaster both for themselves and for the churches they shepherd. This is what led me to one particular event in the life of Saul where I'd like to spend the rest of our time together this morning. It's found in 1 Samuel 15. For the sake of time, we're not going to read the whole passage. I believe that many of you will be familiar with the story and where we find ourselves. We pick up in Gilgal. The word Gilgal means to roll away. It was here where God told Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Well, this might have been where Israel rolled out of Egypt, but was also where Saul rolled out of the favor of God. Gilgal was the location of several key events in Saul's life. First, it was the place where he was anointed as king, the place where he was, should I say, coronated as king, and the people rejoiced in Gilgal when Samuel, the prophet, set forth Saul as king, and he also warned In 1 Samuel chapter 12, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart and consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. In other words, all right, God gave you what you wanted, but be careful how you use it. Be careful how you drive that car. You know, this is on a little bit of a sidetrack, a good word for Calvary Chapel, Consider the great things God has done for you. Will you just give an amen if you believe God has done great things in Calvary Chapel through the years? Amen. Consider the great things God has done for you. However, see too how you steward what's ahead of you. Because God's blessings aren't poured out based on the things that were done in the past. God's blessings are poured out on how we choose to handle the future and the present. We learn and glean from the past and our heritage and our legacy and the work that the Spirit did and we long to see God do it again. But not from a place of idolization, from a place of expectation. Where is God wanting to take us into the future? Well, fast forward two years, we find ourselves again at Gilgal. Saul is set in battle array against the Philistines. He's outnumbered. Samuel says, wait seven days. Don't make an offering until I arrive. To Saul's credit, he tries to wait. He tries to do the right thing. He waits seven days, but then Samuel doesn't show up in Saul's timing. He starts to get paranoid. He starts to freak out, and he makes his own decision to make sacrifices to God outside of the will of God. In 1 Samuel 13, we read when Samuel confronts Saul on his actions, Saul said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore... I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. One translation says, I worked up the courage. Another translation says, I forced myself. But at the core of his decision, this would be the thing that marks Saul's life and rule from this point on. He was a self-compelled man. So it was at Gilgal that Saul tasted independence from God's word It was there that Samuel warned him. He set in motion a chain of events that would ultimately get him ousted from the throne. And this leads to our last incident at Gilgal. We started with a coronation and a celebration, which led to a compromise and a downfall. 
And now, in chapter 15 at Gilgal, God will completely reject Saul as his anointed king and embrace David as the anointed king of Israel, though there would be a great period of time in between those two realities coming to pass. Saul was given one more word from the Lord. We might call it the last divine driving test for Saul as the anointed king. The word came from the Lord to wipe out and destroy all of the Amalekites, from youngest to oldest, from servant to king, every animal and every life. Now the purpose of the study this morning is not to uh, argue God's justice of the destruction of the Amalekites. We know and we believe that God holds the final word of justice over all humanity. Every judgment that he makes is right and good. The Amalekites dealt treacherously with Israel as they were coming out, Exodus 17, of Egypt. And God, from that point on, when the Amalekites attacked the people of God, he said, I will be at war with Amalek and I will judge them. And what goes around comes around, and that time had come, and God gave Saul the opportunity to walk in obedience in this command. By the way, this should serve as a fair warning to those nations who seek to take advantage of Israel in time of vulnerability, that God does not look favorably or lightly upon that. But the time had come for God's righteous judgment to be executed. He gave the responsibility to Saul He sent it his word. He sent the prophet. He made his instructions perfectly clear. He was not vague. It appeared Saul was ready to obey. He goes into battle. He experiences great victory over the Amalekites. And yet the Bible tells us that Saul and the people, in verse 9, kept Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and took the very best of the plunder and the animals and destroyed all the worthless things as it seemed right to them. When Samuel arrives on the scene, we have arguably one of the most famous conversations in the Old Testament, one of the most memorable stanzas as Samuel teaches Saul why obedience is greater than sacrifice. So the remainder of my time, I know I've said that like twice already, but I'm trying to move through here. I want to show you four characteristics of Saul in this incident that we must seek to avoid at all costs in our ministry. I'll just tell you what they are and then we'll dive into them. Number one, we'll see that Saul was selectively obedient. Number two, he was self-reliant. Number three, he was sin-defending. And number four, he was substance-lacking. First, Saul was selectively obedient. We could say that he was selective with God's word and satisfied with partial obedience. Samuel was the prophet. We might say that Samuel was the Bible of Israel in that time, the direct word of God coming through the prophet, right? Hebrews 1, in times past, God spoke through the holy prophets. This was not an opinion of a man, a suggestion. This was the word of God coming with all authority to Saul's heart and to his instruction. The problem did not lie within God's inability to communicate clearly, but in Saul's unwillingness to submit to God's word over his own logic. And Alexander McLaren, he records this. The sentence of Saul is pronounced, not because thou didst spare Amalek, but because thou didst reject the word of the Lord. It was Saul's unwillingness or his desire to be selective with God's word that got him into trouble. I can choose which parts I want to act out. I can choose which parts seem best to me. I can play loose and fast with God's word. Samuel responds, or excuse me, upon Samuel's arrival, the first words out of Saul's mouth when he sees Samuel, he probably already knows like, oh shoot, I'm busted. First words out of his mouth. Verse 13, I performed the commandment of the Lord. Aren't you proud of me? Samuel responds, paraphrasing here, if you obeyed the Lord, what is that sound I hear of bleeding sheep and and of oxen? Because I remember specifically God saying something about like animals and all of them and being gone. And here there's some different picture. How, so how are you defining? I did the will of the Lord exactly. By the way, on a side note, disobedience always seems to have a way of being 
seen and heard by those who are perceptive, even if it's hiding behind words. Well, when confronted with his disobedience and hearing the consequences that the Lord has taken the kingdom out of your hand, Saul continues to try to defend himself. Verse 20 tells us, Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone the way the Lord sent me. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. He's still self-justifying. Hey, I did the big thing. Notice that, that phrase, I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. Saul literally thought, if I went the way the Lord sent me, the fine details don't really matter that much. Wrong. It's dangerous to think that simply because you went in the general direction of God's will, the details of what God commanded don't really matter that much. I don't know about you, but in my experience, it doesn't take much for people to choose which parts of God's truth are convenient to them to embrace compromise in order to accommodate their own preferences or their own desires. I go to church, I read my Bible, I wear the Christian t-shirt, I'm going the way the Lord sent me. But how many times as, as, that we have pass, as pastors or leaders have heard, oh, I'm getting divorced because God wants me to be happy and God knows we love each other and we're married in our hearts and it's only a little compromise, only a little alcohol over here, only a little, it helps me focus on the spiritual things, you know. We kind of shake our heads and go, man, if only people would walk in obedience to God, they would save themselves so much heartache and so much trouble. But friend, pastor, leader, let me lovingly suggest that we must look inward as well. For the pastor or elder or spiritual leader is called, quote, to be an example to the flock in word, in conduct, in love, in faith, in spirit, and in purity. There is no such thing as a perfect or complete pastor We are all shepherds, but we're also all sheep. God is sanctifying us and often in front of everyone else, which can be fairly humiliating most of the time. However, we are called to model complete submission to Christ and the authority of his word in our own lives. We're to model humility and repentance and what it looks like to have a heart that is submitted not only in part, but in full to the entire word of God, not pridefully resistant to the leading of the spirit and to the truth that we like to preach truth that convicts everyone else, but when we have to look in the mirror or we receive truth that convicts us, we as pastors must make sure that our pride is not intact, that our egos are not in charge because Pastoring is not like being a king. You are not the king over your flock. Jesus is the king over your flock. You are a shepherd and a sheep who is called to model and trust the Lord in your leadership over the church. We too must be cautious of any form of Saul that resides in us that would seek to be selective with God's word. We have been called, as Paul said, to give our people the full counsel of God. We are not those who form our sermons or run our ministry by the latest public opinion polls or the carnal desires of the people that we lead. In a modern day culture where progressive Christianity is seeking to undermine the authority of scripture, deconstruction is the new fad, the cool thing to do if you want to truly be spiritual or where entertainers have hijacked pulpits to twist and manipulate God's word for their own gain, we as shepherds can't afford to play fast and loose with God's ultimate authority and his word. This is why Paul told Timothy, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Notice pastoring is not just about what we teach, it's about who we are. It's your pattern of life directly connected to your soundness of doctrine. Every pastor and leader in God's church is called to teach biblically and live obediently. And there is a great danger zone when one thinks that who they are behind the scenes doesn't really matter as long as they get a sense of anointing from the pulpit. Just because God uses someone behind a pulpit is not God's affirmation for the sin that might be going on in their life for the compromise or for the selective obedience to God's word in private. It's a great self-deception to think, well, God gave me a victory, so that means I must have obeyed him and he's on my side. 
God gave you a victory because he's God and he deserves the glory and he's sovereign and he's going to do whatever he wants to do through whoever he wants to do it. Notice how Saul was satisfied with partial obedience in his life. I don't know who the first person was to say it because it's scattered throughout pretty much every commentary on the chapter, but it's a true statement nonetheless that partial obedience is disobedience. I can put it like this. There's no amount of partial obedience that can compensate for areas of disobedience and disregard for God's word. The pastor should not be one who says, I studied hard for my sermon. I gave an awesome message on Sunday, but I lied to, what, I lied to my wife Monday about that foolish and impulsive purchase I made. Oh, I've stayed humbled in the ministry. I don't take glory. I don't pursue greedy gain. But I refuse to repent or acknowledge or confess those things in secret when no one's watching. Friend, we do not have the luxury of being selective. Listen, in deceiving ourselves that God is as proud as we are of our strengths and turns the same blind eye that we do towards our failures. Do not hear me wrong. This is not an expectation that tomorrow you will be perfect. King David, by God's own admission, was a man after God's own heart. Yet he experienced great lapses of faith and judgment and seasons of failure and some great losses because of his poor decisions. David lost his firstborn child after birth due to his moral failures. David lost children as adults due to his parental failures. Due to some of his leadership and political failures, David saw the lives of innocent inhabitants of Israel come under God's judgment. David experienced serious loss when he decided, instead of trusting the Lord, Saul's after me, I'm gonna go hide with the Philistines. That's a good idea. I'm going to go take all my men with me and leave their families vulnerable. That's another good idea. Because David was afraid and lonely and he didn't know what to do. And those are never good counselors outside of God for any person to make decisions about. And he goes and he comes back and all the families are gone. And all these men who would go across the river to get him a cup of water now want to stone him to death. And yet it was in that moment where the Bible says, and David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. There's always this thing about David where through every lapse of judgment and moral failure and difficulty and inconsistency, somehow when God's word came to him, he was able to find a place of humility that bowed before God's word, that came to a place of repentance in his heart, a change of course that allowed David to continue to be usable by God. He would say the sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a broken and contrite spirit. These, O oh Lord, you will not despise. So, say, so Saul, we see here, he was selectively obedient. Number two, we see that Saul was also self-reliant. I could put it like this. He was led by self-perception over divine connection and circumstances over conviction. In other words, in key decisive leadership moments, Saul's first thought was not, what did God say? His first thought was, what do I perceive? What do I want? What do I think is best? And ultimately, because Saul trusted his ideas and his agendas and his understanding more than God's divine wisdom, he paid the ultimate price. Sad reality is Saul didn't have a personal connection with God. It was revealing when Saul speaks to Samuel about the sacrifices and he calls God, the Lord, your God. In other words, there was a disconnect that we, that we saw in David's life, right? David, David, David would say, it's better to be a doorkeeper. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. Where Saul, he, he, he saw God as a distant sort of boss someone he had to appease, a religious system he had to form into in order to get his own agenda accomplished. He had no personal connection or conviction to know God's will. He would occasionally seek Samuel. He would occasionally seek some means to try to understand what God wanted, but he didn't have a personal connection with God. Saul did not care about some voice of God. 
He had his own voice, his own ideas. It was, God, bless my ideas, rather than, God, give me your heart. He was also led by circumstance, not conviction. That was, that, in, in short, saying, every decision he made was based on being externally driven by what was going on, not internally driven by what was good and right and true. Saul was short-sighted. His question always seemed to be, what seems best to me at the moment? If we look at verse 9, we read that, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. They were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. In other words, I know what God said, but it seems best to me in this circumstance that we need to work around this a little bit. I believe the source of Saul's growing sense of all, the source of all of these problems was Saul's growing sense of self-importance, entitlement, and pride. Samuel challenged this in verse 17. We read there, so Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? There's a time when Saul was like hiding, trying to be like, I, I don't know if you got the right guy. He said, when you were small in your own eyes, that was a great opportunity for God to do something with you. But now you become self-inflated and the Bible actually tells us here that before he came to Gilgal, he was in Carmel. You know what he did in Carmel? He set up a monument to himself. How do you go from being small in your own eyes to setting up monuments to yourself and your victories? Happens a lot in the ministry. The pulpit has to be a place of servanthood, not self-promotion. Setting up monuments to ourselves and our victory and our legacy is not our job. Our job is to point people to the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ that that he might be first and centered in their lives until until they go and meet the Lord. In Saul's mind, he made justifications for why it was okay to keep the sheep and the oxen and the plunder. It made sense to him. Surely God won't mind if I take some liberties to do what I think is best. I deserve a cut. I deserve some praise. I deserve some acknowledgement for what God did. And these tendencies create a lot of problems in the ministry. When pastors lead from a place of self-perception rather than divine connection, the ministry will ultimately lack the fruit and the power of God's leading. When pastors rashly react to their external circumstances rather than being led by internal convictions, they might get a temporary solution, but they trade it for a lasting blessing. And what's terribly frightening to me, for myself and all of us in this current time, is that it seems that pastors are being encouraged more than ever before to imitate worldly corporations, type A CEOs, and the emphasis is on holy strategy over the Holy Spirit, opinion polls over steps of faith, initiatives over intimacy, human wisdoms and philosophy over the power of the gospel and the authority of God's word. And pastor, if we need anything, we need to learn how to get back on our knees to find our prayer closets, to hear and ask and seek and knock and to trust the Lord and take steps of faith, to hide his word in our hearts, to trust the sufficiency of the power of the gospel and to give us minds to pursue wisdom. I like strategy. God has called us to use wisdom and stewardship. He doesn't just say, uh, just sit around and do nothing and do it in the name of being led by the Spirit. He entrusts us with finances and physical resources, giving us the minds to pursue godly strategy and and wisdom. But here's a hard truth. Strategy, resources, excellence, organization, money, stages, sound systems can never sufficiently compensate for a lack of the Holy Spirit's power at work in a church. In a day where carnal men 
are building carnal kingdoms by carnal means under the facade of the church and in the name of Jesus. It is our God entrusted responsibility as Calvary Chapel pastors to carry on the legacy entrusted to us from the beginning of this movement. Movement. Be a servant hearted leader, personally connected to Christ, full of God's Spirit, equipped with the knowledge and the conviction of His Word, and full of faith to see Jesus glorified, the saints sanctified, the lost rectified, demons terrified, and the world mystified as they watch the power of God on display. The third thing we find is that Saul was sin-defending. He chose excuses over repentance and blame over personal responsibility. Samuel finally declares to Saul with much sadness after weeping all night that God made up his mind to replace him. And when the reality of Samuel's words hit Saul, he desperately tries to salvage the situation, not by repenting, not by humbling himself, but by trying to excuse away his actions. When confronted in verse 15 and again in verse 21, Saul blames the people for the disobedience and gives spiritual sounding excuses in which he reveals the weakness of his character and the weakness of his leadership. In verse 14 and 15, when, he challenge, when Samuel challenges him, why do I hear the sheep and the oxen? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. Even though in verse 9 it said Saul and the people, he just conveniently left him, him, himself out of that equation. The people, they're the ones who did it. Oh, and they did it to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Aren't you proud of us? Again in verse 21, he tries again. The people took the plunder. The sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Saul tries to distance himself from from personal responsibility. Listen up, pastor, leader. We can blame all the problems in our church on the people. We can blame all the problems in our home on our wives or on our kids. But with the Lord, the buck stops with the buck. We can make all the excuses in the world about the failings of others and how they hurt us, but here's the reality. If you and I fail to lead well in essential moments, giving heed to the voice of the godless culture around us or the opinions of the people in front of us or the carnal desires inside of us, we will carry the weight of responsibility. We don't want to go back to the garden where it just started the blame game. It's the woman's fault. It's the serpent's fault. It's God. Ultimately, it's your fault. No, we want to be those who are not ashamed that our nakedness is exposed in front of the Lord because ultimately, notice in verse 25, Samuel confronts Saul's sins and Saul's response is, Samuel, please pardon my sin. Of course, the problem here is obvious. Saul shouldn't have been asking Samuel for forgiveness. God, she should have been asking God for forgiveness. David's response to his confrontation of sin was, against you, O Lord, have I sinned and done this great evil in your sight. Pastor, I don't need to wonder whether there is sin lying at your door seeking you. I already know the answer. It's yes. I don't have to make a judgment or an accusation to wonder if there's ever been some failure or disobedience in your life. I know there has. The question today is, will you and I choose to live out the same gospel that we preach to everyone else? That when we lead poorly or choose wrongly, that we confess to the Lord, we take personal responsibility, we show humility, we show repentance, or will you let the Saul rule on the throne and become defensive and self-justifying and blaming? Let's finish this up. Number four. He was substance lacking. We might say that Saul was concerned with appearance over substance and praise over criticism. He pleads with Samuel to pardon his sin. And notice in verse 25, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Verse 30, 
Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now and please before the elders of my people and before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Saul quickly says, okay, I sinned. Okay, let's just get, get out. I sinned. Get that. Now that's out of the way. Now come back with me because what really matters is that all the people and elders see me worshiping with you so they think I'm good. In ministry, we can be tempted to think that our success is based on how people perceive our spirituality rather than the actual state of our spirituality. Saul seems to say the right words, but his motive is clear. I need the people to see that I'm okay and that God is still with me. I don't really care if he is or not. As long as they think it, as long as they think he is. What does this tell us? That Saul really believed that the success of his rule was not based on whether or not God affirmed him, but whether or not people affirmed him. Warren Wearsby put it like this, Saul wanted a good reputation, but he did not want true character. But herein lies another subtle temptation in the ministry. In today's media-driven, image-worshiping culture, it's easier to create the appearance of spirituality, the appearance of a vibrant ministry, without actually establishing the substance needed to make it what it really needs to be. I would just encourage all of us that if we want people to be encouraged by seeing what God's doing in our lives or through our ministry, that we actually start focusing on the substance of who we are and the substance of what's going on in our churches rather than pictures and videos so that people can think something is happening. Some people are enraptured by the thrills of ministry, the frills of ministry, and that which gives them the chills in ministry, but they neglect to drill into the foundation bedrock of integrity They fail to kill their carnal and fleshly desires. They refuse to stay still and wait on the Lord. They try to sustain their ministry on a spiritual sugar high without ever consuming the things needed for strength, stability, and long-term fruitfulness. They might ride the crest of the ministry wave, but when it crashes, they discover they never really learned how to swim. Saul's impression was as long as he checked the boxes of what worship was supposed to look like, he didn't need to be an actual worshiper. And this is ultimately reflected in one of the most famous sayings. I know I'm over my time, but let's just briefly look at it. Verse 22, chapter 15, Samuel confronts Saul's thought, like, all I need to do is check the boxes, right? I brought the sacrifices. Won't God be happy with that? Verse 22 and 23, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. God wanted more than the external sacrifices of religious duty. He wanted the internal sacrifice of a heart that wanted to be submitted to his authority. I think this is powerful when he says that these sins, idolatry and witchcraft, we think, wow, those are powerful sins. Idolatry and witchcraft. Ultimately, Saul would turn to both of those things before his life was over. And we might think, man, that's not me. I preach the truth. Idolatry. I'd never be involved in idolatry and witchcraft. Well, are you stubborn when God's spirit challenges and convicts you? Are you a little bit rebellious when God says surrender and you choose to control? When God says go and you choose to stay? When God says stay and you choose to go? When God says speak and you choose to stay silent? When God says stay silent and you just won't shut up? It really brings us to a deeper exploration of what God sees and what matters Last year, I I wrote a letter to our city council because I didn't believe that the man who called himself a pastor, who held queer revival and drag 
queen bingo, drag queen bingo family night at his church, should be nominated to be on our public library board, which was doing drag queen sh reading hours. So I wrote a letter to the city council, and, and I... And the city and, and hundreds of people from our church showed up and we prayed on the steps of the city hall and, and they didn't nominate him. And I had the gall to tell our church that a pastor who celebrates the practice of sin, who has a husband, is not a true pastor and that church is not a true church. By the way, that will get you sued. Here's why I share that story. It was devastating to me when this man who needs Jesus, desperately pray that he finds Christ, made the statement in an interview, through this all, two other conservative evangelical pastors in our community apologized for Pastor Josh's actions, acknowledging that this isn't the loving way of Jesus. I almost went and flipped some tables. Don't be a Saul. Don't be so pragmatic that you have to be driven by the opinions of the loudest culture or carnal voices in order to be perceived as loving or tolerant. Who cares about how you're perceived? What we need to care about is who we really are and what God has really said. A.W. Tozer said, the final test of love is obedience, not sweet emotions, not willingness to sacrifice, not zeal, but obedience to the commandments of Christ. As pastors, do we find ourselves chasing donkeys, leading in a way that is driven by the flesh, marked by pride, resistant to the spirit, selectively obedient, self-reliant, sin-defending, and substance-lacking, or are we tending sheep, shepherding the flock of God which is among us with humility, deep connect, deeply connected with God, reliant on the power of the spirit, and in submission to his word? I'm asking us all today to do something that Saul seemed incapable of doing, to look with honesty and softness of heart at the perfect law of liberty and allow God's spirit to do in our lives that which will allow us to be moldable, shapeable, and usable for God in the long-term picture of our lives. If you have a carnal desire or pattern that's in the driver's seat. Do what Saul failed to do. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up. Fear the power of your sin, but trust in the limitless grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who has given his life that you can be more than a conqueror, full of his spirit, and useful for his purposes. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word and I know there's a lot there to unpack, and I know it's hard, hard things to say and hear, but Lord, I really believe, at least I know looking in the mirror of my own heart and seeing the inconsistencies and the failures and the hypocrisy that has gripped my life in certain seasons and times of ministry, what we need as Calvary chapels and what we need as leaders and pastors in our, in our churches for, for the ability to move forward, being fruitful, and to see you do amazing things, Lord, is, is to ensure, Lord, that we are not those who are doing ministry in the work of the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit. So we humble our hearts before you, Lord, and we ask that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would lead us to repentance not a repentance of the world, but a godly sorrow. And that we might meet that sorrow with joy. The joy that we are forgiven, declared righteous, not by our own works, but by the sacrifice and the work of Christ. And may we take that gospel to this world who is so desperately in need of your love, of your truth, and of their forgiveness of their sins until the day you return. We look to you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.